From ghoulies and ghosties. From ghoulies and ghosties. And long leggedy beasties. And long leggedy beasties. And things that go bump in the night. Good Lord! Deliver us. Deliver us. Spooks and Spook Cats, 2023 has come and gone, and it's time to reflect and review the best and worst films that I saw in this year of our Lord, 2023. But before we do that, let me take care of the castle keeping notes. Thank you for tuning in to Count Rahoon Presents. If you like what you see, be sure to like this video and subscribe to our channel. If you want to take your support an extra step further, might I suggest becoming a patron through our Patreon page. Go to patreon.com forward slash drahun to pledge $5 a month where you will get exclusive access to our private Facebook group known as the Council Lounge Lizards. Once there, you will be able to access our content early and ad-free and have your name amongst the ranks of the undead, along with Zach Robinson and Kova Gentry. Now that that's out of the way, let's get into the heart of the matter. Hopefully you won't feel the need to drive a stake through it. I debated on whether or not I should actually do a best of, worst of list of 2023. Don't get me wrong, I actually enjoy this kind of content. But a lot of other people are doing the same thing, so I didn't know how original any of this was going to be. But I put a poll out on Instagram just to test the waters, and it seems that the bulk of you actually want to hear what I have to say. So, here we go. I do want to caveat and say that if I did not see the film in theaters, it did not make the list. So if you're wondering why Suitable Flesh isn't on the list, well, I really did want to see that movie. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to. I didn't see any theater listings, and so far I'm not quite sure where to find it on streaming. I'm a little bit behind on watching things on Shudder and uh, on Friendly with the Spinguli show, so uh, bear with me. However, I did go to the movies extensively, and um, you know, this was an interesting year for movies. Um, I tried to avoid unpleasant films this year. It's been a rough year for me, so I tried to watch movies that seemed interesting to me, whether they were horror or not. You know what? Let's just cut through the chase, all right? So here's what we're gonna do. I'm just going to do the five best, the five worst, I'm going to do honorable mentions in each category. In addition to that, what I'll do is for the movies that I didn't have a chance to discuss in this video, I'll just put out a full list of all the movies that I've seen this year, and I will rank them, number one being the best, number 22 or 23 being the worst. But there you can see the movies that maybe I liked but didn't necessarily have a chance to talk about because they didn't quite make the honorable mention list or the top five, or the bottom five. I want to end it on a high note, so we'll talk about the best of towards the end of the video. Right now, I just want to get to the worst. I do want to say that the bottom two films, the second worst and the first worst, those movies I actually disliked or hated. The other three, it's not so much that I thought they were bad or I really disliked them at all. They just weren't as good as the other films that I saw this year. So, here we go. Number five, It Lives Inside. Not a bad movie, kind of boring. Uh, it wasn't as great or exciting as I thought it was going to be. I was really looking forward to it because it seemed different. It was a sort of demonic monster kind of film, but it seemed to be stemmed from Indian culture. Um, I actually happen to enjoy Indian films, so I was really hoping that this was gonna be more of an insight into the culture and we were really gonna 
get into the nitty gritty of the folklore and really see an interesting creature design. And I just feel like the movie was kind of slow paced. Um, not as exciting as I wanted it to be. Number four may come as a surprise to you because this movie actually did very well this year. It was one of the highest grossing films of 2023. Barbie. It just wasn't for me. There were things about the movie that I liked. I found parts of it charming and endearingly funny. But this film was clearly not marketed toward a 1,500-year-old vampire male. And that's okay, but uh, just not my favorite movie. A bit overhyped, in my personal opinion. I take that back. Three through one are actually really bad movies. Number three, I've already talked a lot about this movie in a previous review, The Last Voyage of the Demeter. Again, a pretty decent movie until the last 10 minutes or so really ruined it for me. I still see some folks in some of the chats that I'm involved with that really like this movie and thought it was one of the best horror films of the year. I don't see it, but to each his own, I suppose. Still, parts of it were fun. And it was still much more enjoyable than the next film, number two, Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. Funny enough, I didn't hate this movie as much as some people did. It's still not a good movie. Now, I really enjoyed the first 20 minutes of it. It felt like a real Indiana Jones film, despite it being really heavy on the CG. But then after that, it just... It's just a sad, pathetic movie. Like, I don't want to see Indiana Jones deconstructed and made into a miserable, insufferable old man. And I really didn't like this mentality from his uh, girl counterpart in this, played by Phoebe Waller-Bridge, where it's basically, hey, old man, just shut up and die and let the young people take over. It was really, really bad. I don't want to see the young people take over. I want to see Indiana Jones do what he does best. I feel like the entire approach to his character was wrong, it was depressing, and it's just so 14-year-old edgelord. It, it's, not a, it's not a good movie. It wasn't... And the Dial of Destiny, the whole relic, it's such a lame relic. I mean, with the Holy Grail and the Ark of the Covenant, even with the Temple of Doom, it felt like whatever they were chasing after in those movies had some real high stakes. I don't feel all that impressed with Dial of Destiny. Honestly, I think it would have been a better movie if the, the relic was uh, the Spear of Longinus, the, the, the Spear of Destiny, the, the spear that pierced Christ's side. And they could in interject this whole story about how, well, the spear that Hitler got was fake, but there's actually a real, real spear. And they just completely missed the mark. And it was really a waste of Mads Mikkelsen, who is a fantastic actor, to have him play a Nazi who was so much of a Nazi, he was even more of a Nazi than Hitler. So his plan was to go back in time with the Dial of Destiny and kill Hitler and basically tell the rest of the Third Reich, hey, we had to kill Hitler to protect Nazism. It doesn't make any sense. So, yeah... Not the worst film I've ever seen. I think that prize belongs to Jurassic World Dominion. Still, I enjoyed it slightly more than, in my opinion, the worst film of 2023, The Flash. I had to call Michael Keaton to check in on him to see if his back was all right, because he carried this movie, and there just wasn't enough of him to carry the whole movie. It was bad. Ezra Miller is insufferable. I was kind of surprised because I really enjoyed Ezra Miller's performance in Justice League. I loved the origin of The Flash and, and meeting Barry. But then I got to see a full-length movie with The Flash and it was just... It was just, I couldn't take it. It was just so annoying. And it was especially worse because 
you basically got a double dose of a really annoying character. Oh, oh, I wanted to rip my hair out. And my eyes. And my entire flesh. It was such a waste of time. Um, on top of all of that, the CG was just awful. And I know that uh, the director of the film was trying to run cover for it and say that, oh, no, we meant for it to look like that, which I, I think that, yeah, I don't think he's actually being honest about that. I, I, I think that they outsourced the CG to a really crappy company, and it just looks awful. And to think that they spent that much money on the movie, it should have bombed. It, definitely the worst movie of the year, in my opinion. I've heard the folks at Film Threat, uh, when they did their worst of list, they had dishonorable mentions. I don't want to steal too much from them. I will say that two films this year that came out that I didn't hate them. I wouldn't even go so far as to say that I disliked them, but I felt a little disappointed because I felt like they could have been much better. Poor Things probably going to shock a lot of people because Poor Things typically tends to be one of those movies you either really love it or you really hate it. I liked it okay. Um, the reason why I didn't just fall in love with it, I'm getting to the point in my life where I'm just sort of not into really super artsy films anymore. I, I don't know why. Um, Poor Things is a bit of an art house film, I think. Not that there's anything wrong with art house films. It's just, I don't know, my tastes are changing the older I get. But for this one, what, what annoyed me about it was that uh, Yorgos Lothmeros, if I'm saying his name correctly, I don't know how I would have butchered it. English is not my first language, but Yorgos isn't an English name, so anyway. The thing that annoys me about Poor Things is that I feel like the mark was totally missed to tell a much more relatable story. Um, they created this really interesting world that was beautiful and gothic and also sort of melancholy. And yet we didn't get to explore nearly enough of it because we were so focused on Bella Baxter having sex. And that's just not the kind of movie I'm into. Um, not to sound prudish, which, you know, I really loved Frankenhooker. Um, and that movie is a pretty heavy movie in terms of sexuality, but it made more sense in that movie because it's like the movie was told in the world that we live in, and then you throw in the concept of Frankenhooker. Poor things, I just, I was more interested in the world around them. And I just think it would have been a much better movie if we got to see Bella sort of find herself as a person by other means, not just from the sexual perspective. So I just found it a bit annoying. Still a decent movie overall, but it just wasn't my cup of tea. Another film, I was... A little disappointed because I was expecting it to be a little bit better than what it actually was, but it still was a fine movie. Napoleon, directed by Ridley Scott. I don't know. I was just hoping that we were going to get this complex character study of the man, the myth, the legend. You know, I actually met Napoleon once, very briefly. Um, not really what I would have expected. But I mean, like, the movie, I don't know that they did a great job of portraying Napoleon as he actually was. You just didn't get those kinds of vibes from what was seen on the screen from, you know, what he, how he actually was when I interacted with him. Um, it just seemed like the whole movie was just set up to make fun of him instead of, like, actually trying to tell the story of his life and his accomplishments. And I'm not saying that everything about Napoleon is great and fantastic. I mean, obviously he had a lot of dark traits about him. I mean, he was a bit of a tyrant, for sure, but you know, we could have explored all that, but we could have explored his humanity to an extent, and obviously like a little bit more about his um, inner workings, about knowing battle strategy and his genius, but 
uh, I don't know. It just seemed like it was a, a study in just emasculating him. And I just wasn't into it. Still an okay movie. Um, you know, I don't not see it. All right, now that we have that out of the way, let's talk about what went right for 2023. I'm gonna change it up a little bit for this section of the video. I'm actually gonna do my honorable mentions before I count down to the best movie. So, like I said earlier in the video, I really went out of my way to try to watch films that I knew I was at least going to enjoy. I didn't wanna waste my time with a bunch of superhero movies. And honestly, The Flash was so bad, it just, ruined me for superhero movies throughout the year. There were a lot of movies this year that came out that I actually really liked. And of course, there were a few that I loved more than others. So the top two, or really the top three was the easiest. It was actually four and five that I had the most trouble categorizing. So I decided to do three movies for the honorable mentions. Actually, I'm cheating. I'm doing three for the honorable mentions, and then there is a tie for number five. My honorable mentions for the best of category, Thanksgiving, directed by Eli Roth. I didn't have any expectations going into watching this film. I've always had a hard time watching Eli Roth's work, to be totally honest with you. Um, his films have been sort of hit or miss with me. I think Thanksgiving was his best movie. He really knocked it out of the park. It was fun. I felt like this movie did not take itself seriously at all. And that was the charm of it. It was just mindless, good, gory fun. I had a blast watching it. I enjoyed it so much more than I expected. The other honorable mention, um, maybe a bit of a controversial one, Sound of Freedom. If you can divorce yourself from the politics of Jim Caviezel and maybe some of the folks that are associated with the film, it's a truly remarkable film. It's really enjoyable. It's incredible to see that this was a low-budget, independent film uh, that was made several years ago that was finally distributed this year that made a lot of money at the box office almost entirely off word of mouth. Uh, this film outperformed a lot of the major studio films as it should have because the story was compelling and it's a very serious story uh, that needs to be told. And the film itself is not a political one. Some of the folks involved with the film may be political and you make of that what you will, but here at Count Rahun Presents, we focus on the art and not the artist so much, unless they're really, 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 really bad. But that's a whole other discussion for a different video. This was just a simple recommendation. Um, somebody uh, that I met before said that this was a, a really good movie that I should check out. I did, and I loved it. Um, and it was in my top five for a while until I uh, saw a few other films that I uh, think were a little bit better. Uh, but I think that for independent film, um, particularly for independent Christian film, this was a major step in the right direction. So kudos for them. Now that that's out of the way, let's talk about the top five. So tied for number five is a Nicolas Cage double feature, Dream Scenario, which isn't exactly a horror movie, but it's such a unique film. Uh, it encompasses a lot of different genres all at once. It's the story of Paul Matthews and how he mysteriously ends up in people's dreams. Um, at first, it's pretty benign. In some cases, it's a bit uh, spicy, uh, but then it sort of devolves into um, some really scary stuff because some, the, he's involved in some nightmares and some really violent dreams, and he sort of gets the blame for it. And it's a really great study of what uh, uh, of, of what celebrity culture can do to a normal person, and also what happens when somebody goes through cancel culture. Uh, and of course, the other Cage film, um, I've already reviewed it on my channel, Renfield. Uh, to me, the best horror film of the year, since I know it's mostly a horror comedy, but his portrayal of Dracula, chef's kiss. Number four, another horror film. You know what, I, I, I said that Renfield was the best horror film, but it's the best horror comedy film, um, but to me, the best horror film of the year, Talk To Me. Um, a fantastic take on 
possession on and this is what makes a horror film great I mean because it's sort of it a great horror film or a great film is something that really catches the pulse of what's going on in the world a zeitgeist if you will um, it just really brilliantly fuses um, social media clout and uh, demonic and ghost possession together in a really great great story um, and you know it I related to it because it's a it's a story about a, a woman who's grieving the loss of her mother. Uh, very relevant here, unfortunately, in the uh, Drahoon team this year. Three and two may be a bit of a surprise because they are not horror films by any stretch of the imagination. Number three, The Holdovers. Uh, really pleasant coming-of-age story. Uh, Paul Giamatti, I think, gives a phenomenal performance. If you put any stock in the Oscars, I think he would deserve at least a nomination. Um, it's a really great heart-to-heart -heart story about a sort of a jerk of a pro well, he's not really a professor, he's actually a, a glorified high school teacher. Um, but he, it's, it's, this, it's, it's really a love story, uh, not a romantic love story, but it's a wonderful story about how um, a grumpy teacher and sort of an angsty teen and he's not necessarily angsty it's just he's dealing with a lot of issues because he is basically abandoned over over the holiday season and the two learn to appreciate one another and they ultimately love each other almost like a father and a son it, wonderful production value i mean it looks like it was shot in the 70s uh fantastic ensemble cast uh it's it's a really good feel-good movie uh, that you should watch when you have the chance. Number two, American Fiction. Uh, I actually saw it uh, this past evening when I'm recording this video. Wow. Uh, it's a film that has a lot to say and it says it in a really witty way. Um, it, it's a story of uh, an author named Monk who also works as a, uh, a professor. He's put on administrative leave. Uh, while he also flies back to the East Coast for a, a book festival and also to sort of uh, help take care of his family. He's uh, suffered through some, uh, uh, some losses and his mother is also uh, suffering from uh, Alzheimer's. And he's trying to figure out uh, how he can uh, take care of his family when pretty much everyone in his immediate family uh, that's left is kind of struggling through their own issues. And he decides, as a joke, uh, to write a book from the perspective of a, uh, of a, <laughs> he writes a book that is basically supposed to be a caricature uh, of an African American man uh, who grew up uh, in an urban setting and is a, a fugitive from the run, uh, and it's brilliant because uh, he writes the book as a joke and the white publishers are just eating it up and they think it's uh, so important and so brave and uh, it, it, it's a book that needs to be published and put out there and made into movies because it's, uh, uh, it's an important representation of diversity. <laughs> and it's just, it, it's a wonderful um, critique of, of, uh, of, of what we talk about nowadays, about what diversity actually means, what it looks like, and, and what it actually is to be heard, and really like what's been missing from the conversation in a lot of ways. I, I don't want to go too much into it, but um, I, I couldn't recommend that movie enough. And it would be my number one movie this year if it weren't for the number one movie that I'm about to talk about. I've already sort of reviewed it but I just want to say that I, I have actually gone back and re-watched the film. I stand by pretty much everything I said in my initial video. Number one movie of the year, possibly the number one movie of the decade, or of the century, Godzilla Minus One. Phenomenal movie. If you want to see my full thoughts, my full breakdown of the uh, story, uh, you can check out uh, my, I call it a rant, it's not really a review, but it's my Godzilla Minus One rant watch it get my full thoughts on but uh, I actually went back to watch it 
I enjoyed it even more a second time. I'm going to see it one more time next week. Um, we have some more um, humans coming in uh, to the abode. Uh, we're all going to get together and uh, watch it again uh, for the final day that it is actually available in theaters, January 3rd. I'm excited about it. Um, this is the first movie that I've gone back to re-watch in a really long time. So that should tell you something. It's completely worth the hype. I don't care what anyone says. And here's the thing. Maybe I'm being a little bit too uh, anal about things, but I kind of sort of... Well, I didn't unfollow somebody, but I did snooze somebody for 30 days on social media because they said that this movie was overhyped. And I don't know what they're talking about. If the Academy would come to their senses, they should nominate Godzilla Minus One in virtually every category. I have never said that about a Godzilla movie. And look, I get it. The Academy Awards, they really don't matter much anymore anyway. It's just a political and dog and pony show I realize that but if the Academy Awards was actually what some people think it is which is a showcase of the best in cinema uh, th there's no question that Godzilla minus one should be up for some awards I mean Parasite was nominated a few years ago why can't Godzilla be nominated seriously I bet you if they did that the ratings would be through the roof I would tune in to watch if it was nominated for something I'm just saying but anyway that's my best and worst of for the films of 2023. I hope you enjoyed it. Unfortunately, that's all the time that I have, but be sure to tune in because we've got some great things coming your way on Count Rahun Presents in 2024. Until then, always remember that as far as things go and things go bump in the night, there are such things. From ghoulies and ghosties. From ghoulies and ghosties. And long legged beasties. And long legged beasties. And things that go bump in the night. Good lord! Deliver us! <laughs>